Hello and welcome to uh, the National Resource Center, uh, Mass Communication and Journalism Department of Tejpur University. I am Professor Shishir Basu from the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. Today, we are going to talk about uh, how to read film as a text. Now, uh, films and text, when we talk about text, text is associated with uh, something that is written or something that is printed. But uh, nowadays, the, that concept of text has expanded to other uh, medium, like a radio program is a text, uh, a film is a text, a photograph, anything that is recorded and kept and preserved is called a text. So film from that point of view is a text and it has got its own language. Say for instance, whatever we see, the visuals in film, uh, something that we see has got some meaning, but there are meaning beyond that. Say for instance, if we see uh, the photograph of a tree, uh, we will uh, say that it is a tree, but then that tree may connote something that means meaning maybe that it is green, it is lively, it is living and uh, it gives a lot of oxygen. So, something that we see tree as a sign and immediately it tells us that it is a tree, but beyond tree, beyond whatever we see, something the meaning that is embedded in whatever we see is called signified. So, a sign is uh, of signifier that is the tree and signified the meaning that I have talked about production of uh, oxygen and uh, cleaning of the air and so on and so forth. So, uh, when we talk about language, language has got a sign that means even if it is a written word say uh, tree, T R E E, these are signs put together, but when we uh, pronounce or when you see that, uh, that word, it gives us a sign and it also gives us the meaning behind that sign. So, signifier is the tree and signified is the meaning that we usually associate with. Now, each film uh, is, uh, is of mise-en-scene means putting things together like when you see a photograph, you have people in it, you have color in it, you have properties in it, you have uh, different um, uh, things associated like say for instance, I am talking to you now. Uh, and the moment I, I have started talking, you see me and you can say that okay, someone is talking to us from uh, an organized place, say for instance, st uh, studio. Like say for instance, if there is a classroom, the blackboard, the chalk, the table, the podium, all these things are called props that would give meaning and signify that that place is a classroom. So, uh, like the way we write, similarly we also form visuals, put them in an order and create a full length film. Say for instance, frame. Frame is something that we capture from the whole big tapestry, because we want to show only that part and not anything else. Now, a still photograph has got is framed because there is something that the framer or the one who has framed or the director would like to say. So, a frame would have many things in it and they create meaning by being together that is called mise-en-scene and one frame then another frame then another frame put together would give us more meaning to it. So, a frame is a cutout, a still photograph uh, or a boundary that would put things together where we ask people to look into and not other than that, that means not outside of it. A frame uh, is that and many frames together will form a shot. Now, what is a shot? A shot is the time the camera is on and it records and the time when the camera is off is called shot. All the things 
that are recorded from the time camera on to, ca uh, to time camera off is called a shot. Many shots together in a geographical location, in a physical location would create a scene like say market scene, like say classroom scene. There will be many shots in a classroom put together and that would create a scene. And many scenes means many uh, geographical location as the story moves together will be something called sequence and many sequences will form together a film. So, it is frame to shot to scene to sequence to film. Like the way we say a word that is frame, a sentence, many sentences together will form a paragraph, many paragraphs together would form a chapter and many chapters together would form a novel. So, that is how we, we organize. So, we need to understand the structure of a film, frames, short, scene, sequence and film. Now, uh, we do like in any language we have uh, words, we have uh, grammar and then they are put in a certain way to give meaning. So, similarly in film we have language and the language components are say for instance now I have talked about shot, but shot can be different like say for instance uh, uh, long shot. Long shot is always uh, at the beginning of a story establishing where the story or incident taking place. So, long shot another name for long shot is establishing shot. Establishing where the uh, incident or the story is taking place. Mid shot after long shot mid shot comes and mid shot will say that ok you have seen where the environment where the uh, action is taking place or incident is taking place, but do not look around look here only. So, we many things would be visible and important things would be visible that is called mid shot. Many things will be out from the long shot taken out from this and the close up would be uh, very close where exactly the important uh, issue or important thing taking place. Say for instance, uh, if a thief is caught then uh, probably uh, the close up would be his face, uh, his eyes, uh, those are the issues that we put. So, long shot says something to us, mid shot says something to us and close up gives us a different meaning. Similarly, of a shot we say angle like high angle shot will be the camera is held high up because uh, from there you need to see uh, the, the persons or the issue or the things that you would like to see. It is called high angle shot when the camera is up and the subject or the object that you are recording is down under. Now, if you have seen Gandhi film of Richard Attenborough, when uh, in Peter Morrisburg, uh, the railway station where Gandhi is taken out from the first class compartment and thrown out into the platform, the camera was up uh, and from there they showed uh, Gandhi falling down uh, sitting on, on the floor uh, of this um, platform, he looked miserable. So, high angle shots are taken to convey the miserableness of the subject or the object. The opposite is with low angle, when you do low angle shot you, you, you keep the camera down and you look up. So, the moment you have low angle shot uh, you are going to show the object or the subject as robust, powerful and it gives different meaning. So, similarly pan shot the eye level shot will show that as if that is as per your uh, uh, as per your level uh, looking into it almost the similarity and the level is the same. Now, the tilt up and tilt down will be something like tilt up shot will be like low angle shot to show things or objects in a robust manner whereas, tilt down shot will show that uh, the objects are miserable. And there is another shot called tracking shot. This tracking shot is something that as you are moving the camera also moving beside you as if 
the audience who are watching uh, that incident happening will be beside you, following you, uh, tracking you. That's why it is called tracking shot. And in, uh, in uh, a, a frame, you will see certain things uh, in front of the frame. Then there is depth of field, as we say, and there is background. So the, the things that are in front is called the foreground, and the things that are at the back will be called background. Now background always qualifies or gives meaning to the foreground. So these are basic uh, uh, film language. We, we talk, we, we talked about the angles, we talked about the shots, and we, we have also talked as to how they give meaning, uh, whichever angle you put and convey the meaning to the people. Say for instance, lighting. There is something called key light that is the main light illuminating the object in the frame. Then there is something called backlight. Backlight say for instance I am talking to you and uh, there is something in my background and uh, I am separated from the uh, background uh, unless and until you illuminate my back or the, this part of the, of the shoulder. Uh, I may be merged with the background. So backlight is necessary. So we talked about key light which illuminates say suppose me now um, with the key light, then backlight would illuminate my side so that I am separated from the background. Then there is something called fill light. You know I am talking from a studio and in this studio the key light has created a lot of shadows. Those shadows are to be erased so therefore they have put uh, the, the light man has put uh, some other light to erase those uh, shadows. Because if you put shadows, if you allow the shadows to be recorded, then it gives a different kind of meaning and feeling. So therefore, uh, fill light are there, they are to erase the shadows created by the key light. And then you have the background light. That means it will focus on the background and this background light has got a purpose because in the background there are many details that are to be illuminated so that the viewers can, can together with the object uh, and the subject create total meaning. So this is called four point light. This is key light and you have fill light, you have back light and you have background light. Now there is color also color creates mood, like uh, if we go to a party, if we go to a festival, then we dress well and we, oh, oh, we wear usually uh, bright colors. So that creates mood. But when uh, there is a death in the family, somebody passes away, uh, we do not wear very colorful clothing because we will be in a somber mood, uh, we will be sad and therefore we either uh, use white or a very ash color, very subdued color uh, expressing our mood. Sound is another one. The sound is, is, is a language, uh, a part of visual language or of film. Uh, there is nothing called silent film. There is always ambient sound. Even in the outer space, the earth is moving. NASA recently has said that it makes some sound and they have captured the sound and it is available if you are going to new media like uh, YouTube, you will be able to see, able to hear the sound of the earth as it is moving in its axis. Then something called properties which I have explained that in a classroom blackboard, podium, chalk, duster, these are the properties and uh, you need those things to qualify where the action is taking place so that there is no ambiguity uh, among the viewers that uh, we do not know where this action is taking place. Now when we talk about props, we also talk about costumes. Like say for instance, I am wearing certain kind of dress now, but suppose uh, if this would be recorded 100 years hence, then at that time the dress sense should, should come and the dress would qualify the time frame when this was recorded. Say for instance, if uh, 500 years back, if we go and if we depict a king or a queen um, in, from our country, 
from some kingdom, we would require to research on as to what sort of dresses the queen used to wear and what sort of dresses the king used to wear and accordingly prepare our costume so that we will be able to transport our audience to that time frame and there will be no jarring. It will be completely setting nicely, fitting nicely to the stories. Then we have actors. Actors are always there to, to give meaning, to enact the story, the hero, the heroine and other characters. So actors are needed, human beings, they, they can slip into various roles and act. So that is another side, actors give life to the, to the story. And then while we are talking about all these things, what we do is to compose in a frame the properties, the color, the actors and other things that would put together to qualify and this is what we say mise-en-scene. Now I have just very um, briefly, I have touched upon the major part of film language, the things that we use while we are making film and communicate. Many times you do not need sound, you do not need any explanation, you do not need any commentary to explain. You just show and people know where they are and what is happening. The visuals speak through its languages and uh, the, the language that uh, or the components of visual language that we have just discussed uh, are there for you to learn and if you are conscious you will be able to see how they are put together and make meaning. Now Walter Lippmann in his public opinion in the book almost a uh, hundred years back, uh, he said that the world is too vast, it's very huge is fleeting and it is very complex, it is layered. So for ordinary eyes, for us, it is difficult to capture the world as it is around us. So, but we would like to uh, make meaning out of whatever is going on uh, around us. So uh, we need simplification and we need to make our surrounding meaningful. So media does that for us. It takes snatches, uh, views, shots, frames and put them together, stitch together and we know that this is our world. Actually there is a lot of intervention by the people who create that. You know? Media in this case does for us, say for instance a newspaper, there are innumerable incidences happening. But, uh, we cannot put all these incidences in our newspaper. Our newspaper only contains maybe 1% of all the incidences that happened in a particular area. Now, uh, what uh, then human intervention in the form of reporter, editor and the sub-editors, they come together and they find out which one is important, which one should see the light of the day and which one should be discarded. If you have learned the theories and models of communication, you will know that uh, D. White's gatekeeping model is, is that. So there are certain things that we accept, there are certain things which we do not accept and they would not see the light of the day. Putting all these things together would create an artificial, a constructed world for us, though we feel that that is the real world. If for an inc incident, if there are 10 reporters, there could be 10 reports, all different, because their perspective would vary. So similarly, when we take photographs and when we make films, we have different perspectives using the visual language to create a, a, a world for us that is artificial world, that is representative as we say, representative of whatever is going on around. As I am talking to you, I am able to see whatever is in front of me, but I do not see whatever is behind me. So by that dint, almost 50% of the things that are happening around me, I won't be able to see. And media does exactly that. We also do that one. We, we are unable to see everything at one go. 
we see here, we see there, we see there, and then when we are looking at some, some other, uh, some say this angle, I am unable to see whatever is happening to this side. And camera does that for us. It, uh, sn take, it will take snatches and put them together, create story and create a world that is simplified and that is meaningful. Media, whatever it does for representation, that process of representation is called mediation. Mediation means the reality, whatever is happening, the uh, filmmaker or the media persons or the journalists, they intervene, take snatches from there and create that representation. We produce and we consume representations and create meaning within a context. Film is to be seen, the story that is stitched together by a director and other crew members is to be seen from that point of view. Now the process, this process of creation is subjective and it is artificial because one gets involved, one looks at certain things which are to be taken, you know, subjectively. There are many things that he may not notice because his frame of mind would not look into that one. So all this mediation or the product of this mediation representation is artificial, is subjective. Now we create this, this artificial world by getting governed by a certain kind of ideology. What is that ideology? Is the way of looking at life is the way that we notice certain things in, in our life and we take and we reject. So certain things we accept and we create our world with that one, certain things we do away with. So when we are creating on a subject uh, a film, if there are 10 people, they can make 10 films because their ideology may vary and they may see things differently. So therefore, Film is an artificial way, it takes snapshots of the world around us, the happenings that is going on around us, the culture, culture means the material practices of human beings in a location or in an area, in a society. So Raymond Williams have, uh, has very well said that uh, material practices are called uh, culture. So anything that we do from our clothing, food, our games, means sports, uh, the way we cook, the way we read, the way we run our institution, these together form our culture. Now there are two levels of seeing this culture. Uh, one is that whatever we are able to see, that means as I have said food, clothing, our furniture the way we organize our society, the way we organize our houses, the way we organize our institutions like judiciary, like uh, parliament and all these things are part which we are able to see and which we are able to touch. So these are called artifacts, these are material that we can see. But beyond this, there are meanings that are embedded in our mind. There are values that are embedded in our mind. That is also a part of our culture. So material practices is the expression of the value system that we have in us. So there are two aspects of culture. The two aspects of cultural product like a film, like a painting, like a, a, a book because the book will, will consist of words paragraphs, chapters, but all together they tell a story and lead us to something else, give us a different message. It, that message is embedded in that one, but we need to decipher that one. Okay. And then we have uh, the way to, to, to look into like Ronald Barth has said that there is connotation and there is denotation. Denotation he meant the things that we see around, the things that we can touch, the things that we can see. And connotation means 
what do they say? Suppose we see uh, a street with a lot of garbage around. So, we may say that okay, it is not working properly, this place is not clean immediately. Connotationally, we may talk about that uh, the people who are living here, they do not have any sense of cleanliness. Whereas, the denotation would qualify that one. So, connotation gives us meaning and denotation supports uh, that meaning. So, first denotation comes when we see the material, then from there we deduce meaning. Now, I started to, to talk about how to read a film. This was a little bit of uh, digression, but I think that was important because then we understand what film is. Now, how to read a film then? We need to uh, read film as a piece of creation with all its languages, the languages that I talk to you. Uh, we can find out what sort of language they have used and what sort of meaning they wanted to create. The whole film can be read by that. So, focusing on the language like uh, uh, how the costume was used, how the story was woven, how the color was used, how the, how the light was used, all these things can be put together and you can make a good study of a piece of film. A whole film of 120 minutes can be studied from the film language only. The other uh, way of reading is that you know every film has got an addressee and addresser. That means we see actors and the actresses in front of us enacting, uh, telling us uh, the story through their dialogues. So, there is addresser and addressee that means someone throwing a dialogue to another person uh, intending. Say for instance, if we take Ramayana that uh, Rama is telling something to Sita when they were in the forest. So, Rama in this case would be addresser and addressee will be Sita. But when uh, Ramayana uh, talks about different actors, we see the depiction of them. Actually, it is the author of Ramayana telling to the reader like us and you that what really happened. That author has got certain meaning to give to us through the addresser and the addressee. The actors and the actresses, they are the addresser and the ad addressee and author is the sender and we are the consumers, we are the receivers. Now, uh, this is one way of looking at it. And we can also see a film uh, from the societal point of view. There may be some issues that have been depicted, say for instance, status of children in our society, status of education in our society, status of agriculture in our society. So, and then there are many other issues uh, could be negative, could be very positive. Uh, the, the sports can be depicted. So, that could be an issue and we can write about it. Then there are other human issues like in my other lectures I have talked about uh, the health issues that can be also depicted. So, we talk about the issue, we do not talk about the addresser addressee, we do not talk about the languages, but our focus is on the message and on the issues that uh, was that was depicted in, in the film. Then uh, also there is something called a discourse analysis beyond all this uh, light and costumes, addresser and the addressee like actor and the actresses and the societal issues. Actually, the author would like to place to us the knowledge that has been created through this storytelling. Say, for instance, when we read Ramayana, we know that good will always prevail over bad. No, the evil will always be defeated by the good. And that is the basic message, that is the discourse, that is what we talk about the knowledge, the wisdom. So, when we see a film, we can go deeper into it and we would like to say what sort of knowledge this film has given to us. Therefore, uh, when we are uh, reading a film, that means we want to find out more meaning, we can uh, see it from different uh, perspective. We can see it from 
the language point of view and we can analyze the language. We can also see from the addresser and addressee point of view, sender and receivers. That means what does the author tell us or the director tell us in this film. And uh, then we can look into how uh, you know societal issues have been depicted and uh, also look it from the discourse analysis point of view, how discourse uh, has been uh, formed, evolved through action and interaction and arguments and uh, various characters would be depicting like always we have in film a hero and a villain. You know, they fight over an issue and at the end of it they, uh, usually the hero wins because he represents the goodness of the human society. So therefore, film reading uh, is a good task in the sense that uh, it is an instrument of empowerment. Uh, means that if we read a film and if we analyze the film within ourselves, it gives us uh, a certain kind of strength to see things differently, not the way uh, you know the, our analysis would, would help us to, to look uh, uh, beyond whatever is shown or even sometimes many conventional ways that we uh, see a story and understand a story. Uh, why film uh, is to be considered as an instrument of empowerment? Because film requires a certain kind of environment. It needs a theater, it needs a dark room and where all your senses will be focused on whatever goes on in the, on the screen. And therefore, uh, the film is able to enter into our senses, it uh, attracts all our attention and we understand the, the film, the story and also the philosophy of this uh, film. And that is how it empowers us because it is a kind of deeply analyzing the story that has been or that is presented to us. Michael Foucault in his uh, writing has said that representation is always a discourse it is creating always knowledge. So, representation like in the for, for instance film or what media does is always presenting a discourse to us. It helps us to create knowledge and by knowing that knowledge, by knowing uh, the messages we get empowered. So, from Foucault's point of view it is not only you know uh, uh, an instrument of, of empowerment, it is also an uh, um, uh, important issue, important instrument to gain knowledge. And the power comes when we gain insight to see things differently. We are able to get ourselves empowered because we question whatever is given to us. We are able to evaluate, we are able to see in a different way, mostly I would say uh, in a critical way. So, uh, we can uh, usually uh, look into films in this manner. It is not only a source of entertainment, but it is a source of knowledge and it is a source of empowerment, an instrument of empowerment. So, we are coming to the end of this uh, lecture where we have discussed as to how to read a film how to see a film and make meaning of it. We have talked about uh, various language components of film. Uh, we have talked about how uh, film is, is made uh, like say from frame to, to a film with shots, with sequence, with scenes coming together, all together forming a film. So, uh, I am sure you will now look into film as text and read it and read it differently than the others do it because you will be conscious about the fl film language, you will be uh, conscious about the addresser and addressee, the sender and um, the receiver. Also you would see from the discourse point of view, uh, what discourse, what knowledge it is creating and at the end if these things surface to you, you will be empowered. And I am sure 
you yourself would start liking film, analyzing film and gain from watching a film. Thank you very much for being with us.